Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to you wherever you are in your day in the world and welcome to Past Virtual Summit 2020 uh, and my session on designing reports for effective storytelling. I'm um, excited and honored uh, to be here uh, speaking at Past Virtual Summit this year and uh, really looking forward to this session and the other sessions where I am an attendee. Because uh, as always with Summit or SQL Saturday, if I am not presenting, I am in the chair getting my learn on. So uh, let's dig right into this. Uh, welcome. This is um, particularly challenging. Uh, doing a presentation is hard enough. Uh, doing it virtually is a little harder without, you know, seeing people in the room. And doing a recorded session is extra hard. Uh, I will uh, have some technical challenges I appreciate your patience with. And uh, I will stick around at the end of this recorded session for a live uh, Q&A session where I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, if I don't get to it then, um, or you can't, actually make it to the end, then send me an email. So uh, let's dig in. Uh, designing reports for effective storytelling. One of the really great things about past summit and SQL Saturdays are the different points of view you get on all of the different things in our profession as data professionals, whether it's a DBA or developer track or a, a BI analyst. There's so many different ways. So what I'm going to do here today is a very introductory um, course uh, on my take. Um, there's lots at PASS, uh, lots that PASS has to offer between virtual groups, local user groups, uh, Summit, so excited, and SQL Saturdays. Um, so exercise the resources you have available to you and, and dig in and learn. Your feedback is important. We do want to hear about what works, what doesn't work. Bring it on, the good, the bad, the ugly, because uh, we can only improve if we know what needs improvement on. Uh, so let us know. And if we hit it out of the park, uh, we love hearing that too uh, when it works. And we're doing all we can in, in these particular times and excited to still have a summit uh, and look forward to a face-to-face -face with you uh, next year in 2021. Uh, my session here, Designing Reports for Effective Storytelling, I put together just for Summit uh, on uh, my take on some ideas to keep in mind when you do your reports. This is intended to be a very beginner level uh, for a introductory to some concepts in reporting and storytelling uh, of, of data, uh, using data for telling a story. And it's my take. Uh, quite fortunately, this session is part of the learning pathway uh, here at Summit this year. I uh, attended some of these last year. I really liked the idea, and I went to several of these pathways last year in person at Summit and was honored to be invited to go pr participate in one as a presenter this year. Uh, and I am starting it off with the first day of Summit with my very introductory uh, designing reports for effective storytelling, and I am followed uh, in the conference by my esteemed colleagues, uh, Megan Longoria and Reed Havens with some more advanced concepts in uh, reporting and, and data visualization and storytelling. I'm looking forward to attending those sessions. I recommend you do uh, fit them in on your uh, agenda as these pathways and all of the pathways um, are really nice and tied together. It's a shame we're not in person where we get to share the room together. Uh, like we did last year, but we will pull that off next year. So uh, mark those down, find those on the on the schedule, and and dig into those sessions as well as as mine is just an introductory, uh, and the others will run with some more ideas and concepts. Uh, this is me, but this session isn't about me. Uh, I'm a data technology consultant. I work for myself. Uh, I have for years, uh, and that's all I do now. I got my start and into technology in the 90s when I was interested in data. I have been a VP of IT, a director. Uh, I currently organize the local SQL Saturday here where I live in uh, Orange County, California in Southern California. I lead the local user group where we meet once a month when we can face to face 
and have presentations and, and usually some cocktails afterwards. And when I can, I volunteer at the local uh, scout camp where I teach fishing and archery uh, to kids, both young and old. Uh, I am a proud father of three boys, a husband and live music fan. I am a certified bluesaholic. I cannot get enough uh, of the blues. Uh, no cure, no recovery. And I am seriously joining not getting a live music fix for way too many months now at this point. So that's me. This isn't about me. This is about this session. Um, my blog isn't working and I never really posted on it much anyways. Uh, I don't really spend much time on Twitter. So that email at the top is your best way to track me down. I do spend more time on LinkedIn than I do on any other social medias um, as there's a lot of really good content there and I comment on a lot. Uh, and some colleagues I work with at Collective, we've posted a bunch of really good content there. So um, you will find me there. Overview, this session is really an introduction to some concepts on effective storytelling. I'm gonna talk about some legacy reporting and I am gonna spend a not insignificant amount of time on this because I think it's important to understand where you come from, what you have, what your users, your customers, are accustomed to as you go down your journey of uh, effective storytelling and using data and advancing your company with data analytics. Uh, we'll get into some layout considerations and some tips and tricks I have and my take on some of that. Uh, I'll show you a tool that I've developed for creating backgrounds to help create a consistent, uh, organized, professional look and feel to your presentation. Uh, we'll talk a little about visuals uh, how many on a page, some considerations with them, that'll get mixed in throughout, uh, report templates and so on. So let's get into this. I usually like to query the audience. Uh, usually when I'm waiting for the, my session to start, I'm setting up and I'm asking everyone who's already in the room about some things. What are you doing? Where are you at? Uh, sometimes when I teach these classes online, we'll actually send out a survey in advance. Don't really get to do that now, so I uh, answered the, one of the questions for you and made an assumption that many of you are relatively beginner in some of this. Uh, advanced users will absolutely pick up something from this uh, when you're experienced, but so you understand how I usually like to teach, I usually have a little more um, information on the attendees in the room so that I can tailor the presentation to be uh, most appropriate for those in attendance. Um, so I'll do my best with that today here on a recorded session. Legacy reporting. Nothing really is a possibility. You really genuinely might really not have anything really, but you probably do have something, uh, whether it's some vendor applications, you might have multiple, you might have a vendor uh, general ledger system where you get some financials from, uh, you might have a ERP that had some production or manufacturing or costing information. I'd be surprised if you told me you didn't have any reporting in Excel because that's pretty much unheard of. There is always reporting in Excel and um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's been a great tool. It's the, one of the number one BI tools in the world uh, and it has its place. It also has its limitations. Uh, SharePoint is a great collaboration tool. Uh, I have used it and I will show some examples on how I've used it as a presentation place for reports. And we'll talk a little about SQL reporting services. Uh, I do a lot of work with reporting services. I have since it was released 16 years ago and it is a great tool for what it is. Uh, it also has its limitations and I personally do I prefer to do less and less with it because of its limitations and challenges and uh, we can do so much more, uh, so much easier with Power BI, which is really the focus of what I want to dig into here. So uh, along this concept of some of the legacy reporting, this is a legacy report manager portal. Uh, this is the old 2008 R2 look and feel. Uh, it's a collection of folders with reports in the folders. In 2016, we got an update. It's no longer called Report Manager, it's called Report Portal. 
you may have this. If you don't have this and you think you have this, it's because your organization is not upgraded to 16. I highly re recommend you do for mainly for some of the performance enhancements. And if you're doing a lot of reporting services, there's some new features we got. But otherwise, it was mostly a lipstick um, look, uh, a little bit of a makeup change, no real functionality change with the portal aspect of it. I've never actually used either of these. This is from a production environment, but my users didn't go there. They went to this page, SharePoint. And this is a page of a bunch of links to the reports themselves. So you click on the link and it actually takes you to the report, the SSRS, SQL Server Reporting Services Report, um, and runs that report. And I really, really like this presentation because I was able to put a whole lot of reports on one page, a whole lot of links to reports on one page and organize them however I wanted, regardless of the folder structure on where the reports were organized. And I could use a different cataloging of them on the report manager or report portal over the presentation layer. And I was able to fit a lot more on a fewer screens and be a lot more effective presentation of the report solutions to the end users. A little bit more about that later. Um, and when we talk about Power BI and the Power BI service, and we talk about workspace versus apps. Here's some reporting examples. We'll go into these uh, more in detail, um, but it's important to understand some of the examples. And one of the concepts I'm pushing here with, uh, I'm promoting here with effective storytelling and uh, consistency in your environment. This is actually a SSRS report. Um, I forget and forgive me as I, get used to the virtual and the recorded. This I'm talking about right here, since you don't see my green dot on the screen, uh, is actually an SSRS report embedded in a SharePoint page. Uh, you could embed that in just about any web page. It wouldn't have to be SharePoint. It could be ASP, uh, legacy HTML. Uh, it's just a report that's embedded. It is interactive. You can click on it. It defaults when you go to the page to yesterday. But it will, uh, when you click on it, change to week to date. And then I think it goes to last four weeks or something like that. Don't, don't recall for sure. But um, that is a, an example of some reporting embedded in a web page. Here is the wall of numbers. I like this slide because this story has stuck with me for the close to 20 years ago that it happened when a, CE, a COO a chief operations officer told me, Ted, that's a wall of numbers. That report isn't useful. I said, you're right. And I fought you to not create this report. But when we sat down and you told me what you needed and I presented you the first couple drafts, you're like, no, 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 no. I want to see all 24 hours of the day across the top. And I want to see it broken into the three day parts, graveyard, day shift, night shift. And then I want to see all seven days of the week down the left. Uh, it doesn't even have seven days. The other three days are off the page. And uh, I want to see all of those metrics, one, seven or eight metrics for each day with some totals. And I resisted, but complied to your wishes. And sure enough, you're right. It is a wall of numbers and it isn't useful, easy to use report. And I tell you what, if you tell me what the thresholds are for those values, because I don't know if six and a half, there's a number here, six and a half, seven. I don't know if that's good or bad, right? Five, if you tell me what the thresholds are, I will color code it. And no, I will not give you red, green, yellow, because then it's just a checkerboard wall of color. And that's not useful. If it's green, you shouldn't be worrying about it. If it's, it, it's the red, you need to look at. So why don't you tell me what's, what it should not be, and I will highlight the values that are out of range. And you can focus on those, and it'll draw your eyes right to those. And your wall of numbers will become a useful chart because you'll be able to quickly, easily see the ones that you need to see. And uh, they left and did not bring back to me those thresholds because I could have easily come in here and changed that. So I include this as an example of what not to do, but 
that persisted. And for all I know, they're still using that number. I then started introducing uh, gr uh, charts and graphs and visuals. Uh, the limited visuals we had available to us were really usually some line charts or bar charts in reporting services back when this was done 10 years ago. And uh, operations liked it. It made sense. You could see at a glance that sales are down in the middle of that first top left bar chart. Uh, and consequently, transactions are down. Uh, and check average is about the same, but uh, you could see. And ops liked it. Finance said, I don't want the charts. Just give me the numbers. Because originally it didn't have the numbers underneath. It didn't have this table, this grid of numbers. So I, I said, no. And I'll talk about one of the reasons a little later. Um, I said, no, I'll, I'll compromise. I'll leave the charts and I'll give you the numbers. And consequently, a two-page report became a four-page report. And uh, that way, it could get used by more people. Operations still got their charts. Finance got their numbers. I had one report to maintain and not two. All right, let's move on. Interactive dashboard. I did this in SSRS more than 10 years ago. It was an enormous undertaking, and it was worth every bit of the many months it took overall because it was heavily, heavily used, and it was truly an interactive dashboard in that there was no pick parameters run report. It was all click, 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 click. You could click on any of those blue links and the data would change. Um, the time would change, the, the data would change. You could drill down into regions. You could drill down into a day. Um, if this was interactive real, I could click on this 13.3 and see why that was what it was because it would give me the details for region four for Friday hugely useful, probably still heavily used today. However, the um, to do that today, uh, I would not. I would do that in Power BI. And if you pressured me to do it in SSRS, I would push back and tell you to use the right tool for something like this, which is Power BI. I include it here as an example, because we're talking about the legacy reporting and what you may have, and this is some real life examples from my experience. Here we combined a wall of numbers with some interactivity where you could very easily change the time slice or drill into some detail. Uh, a little bit of a, a change in traditional reporting. This is a mobile report uh, done with reporting services for the users wanted to see it on their phone. And it actually shows up on their phone in the body of the email, not as an attachment, which is really useful because on a four inch screen, you don't want to try and open up an XLS or a PDF attachment. You want to see the content right there in the message. And that's what this did. I called it my poor man's mobile reporting because it didn't have enterprise edition. So SSRS mobile reporting option was not available. Again, today, um, I could do that really easily in reporting services. I could also do it even easier on a little mobile version of a Power BI report, which is what I would recommend. All right, um, that's a little bit on the legacy and, and what you may have, a, an example of some stuff that I had seen. And now in the world of Power BI, it's a little different. In Power BI, we have workspace and we also have apps. And you really want, if you're using Power BI now and doing this, you really do not want your users coming to the workspace. They see the stuff down the left with home, favorites, recent, and then they have all the workspaces and, and there, and that is not the optimal user experience. You really should have the workspaces only accessed by the developers or the report writers and not accessible by end users. You want your end users to come to the app. You want them in the app where you see here we have a very simplified interface, uh, much less busy to the end user where they just see the apps on the right. Let's see my next slide. Yeah, here's another example of an app with multiple reports. So here, this little carrot shows us we have more pages to this report. Technically under the hood, that's separate reports which we as developers can manage in different manners. And we may have limitations, right, with the data model size. And we can get around some of that by doing that. And then 
Here you can have all these pages and the user sees it. But to them, it's really one dashboard or app. That they see in Power BI and a much preferred user interface uh, interface over using the Power BI workspace. Uh, avoid this. Use the apps. Where are we? All right, I'm going to watch time. I need to keep time. OK, uh, time to flip uh, from the slides and we'll go look at Power BI service a little bit and I can uh, bring that point home some more. Uh, so we're going to come over here to the browser and this is uh, my my workspace, uh, my service. Let's see. Let's go here. And here you can see various workspaces I have set up for various clients, uh, and they get this look. So again, you wouldn't want your users coming to this because that's just too much going on compared to if they came to the app. And here you would have very distinctive apps where you control who sees which ones by permissions, right? If I were to invite you to this, you would only get to Ted's Tacos, my, my demo site I created with some dummy data to show some examples. Um, you wouldn't necessarily see, um, let's go back to the apps. You wouldn't necessarily see all of the apps. Um, you, you would control it with permissions. But even if you did see many different apps, because maybe you have an operational reporting, uh, a finance reporting, uh, HR reporting, whatever it may be, uh, this is a much preferred over this. There's just less going on, better for the end user experience to get to their data and understand the data uh, on that. Um, in there, um, if we go to the demo site, um, again, you, you have your pages uh, and your reports. And if you have many of them stacked, they would simply show up here. And this would be all that the users would need to learn to navigate with, with some exceptions of using the filter pane and maybe some resetting to some defaults. All right, we're at about 20 minutes in. I got to keep conscious of that because I like to talk and I can talk about this stuff because I love this stuff. So let's go back to slides. And let's pick up where we left off. OK, you still with me? All right. Layout. Uh, I want to talk about some concepts of, of report layout. And studies have shown we comfortably comprehend, absorb, um, effectively handle five or six visuals at a time on a page. And this is five or six visuals, one, two, three, four, five. This is an example of a Microsoft curriculum that I teach in a, in a full day dashboard in a day class where we go from zero to a dashboard in a day. And this is their curriculum, their uh, example. And it's, it's, it, it follows that rule. Um, there's some other design things in here I don't care for. There's some significant wasted space with all of this color around here. Um, that I wouldn't do, and we'll get into some more of that. So here's some uh, examples that I just went on the net and grabbed. Uh, I just went and did a search, and I did a Bing search and found a bunch of these. Um, this one it was kind of neat. It has a little animation to it, which shows how you can click on a visual and use it as a filter, and it changes the other values. Um, here we are, we're talking five visuals in the main body and five cards at the top. Um, reasonable amount to consume. Here's another example. Uh, I really don't know what this is. I grabbed it and interesting, some very interesting um, color use of colors that I, I don't. Here we go with another Microsoft example. 
Uh, this is from some of their marketing where they're pumping Power BI that can easily be found. And there's a lot going on here and not a lot of separation, which I'll talk about. Here on this example, the visuals are overlapping. So we can see here, and I have mixed feelings on this, where this visual is overlapping this one and it works, but this gets really risky when this data ends up higher up on the chart or these labels end up over here like this one did. Um, not a practice that I would embrace, uh, let alone recommend. This one is getting more towards what I'm going to show you and what you've already seen a little bit of on where I go. I like the segmentation of this where the visuals are in their different areas. I, I like the grouping, right? We have these three across the top. We have some cards. Um, it's a little bit mixed up and I, I don't know that I care for that. Uh, sorry, um, on, on some of this. Uh, and then here's another example where it's a little better in my book, um, a little more laid out, uh, a little bit too much going on on this screen. And, and we'll talk about some more of that um, for that. Now we're getting uh, an example of a company I partner with regularly. They have some great visuals that allow you to do right back to the database from within Power BI. But I don't care for this look feel at all. I don't care for the dark. There's no real separation uh, between the visuals, which is a preference of some. And that's what's great about Summit is you get to see different ideas and this is not one I would care for. Now we're really on track to some of my ideas that I'm gonna show you. This is uh, another example from that same company with some zero financials. And then here's my example, uh, and I'm gonna show you how I did this and how you can do some of this and we'll dig in next into some of the pros pros of this and why I like it. Um, and what, the way I did this is I leveraged uh, a background. So I handled the background with all of these, the, the color, the space between them is all in the background. And I created the background by using PowerPoint. And I created a PowerPoint document and I am able to go into PowerPoint and create all kinds of different layouts that I can then use for my report. So I have a consistent look and feel throughout all of the, the pages in that report. And importantly, I share that with my colleagues working on reporting and we all have the same look and feel for a consistent, uh, professional, enterprise grade reporting solution across the organization, regardless of who created it, where they were in their skill set, abilities, and passion for the presentation layer. Um, you can leverage some of that and, and do that yourself. So um, I will show you a little bit about how I got to this using this, and we will flip back to demo time. I have that document open. Let's go to my background creator, and it is a PowerPoint document where I have gone in and created all of these slides with all these different layouts. And the beauty of it is if I'm working on a, a new project for a new client, I personally can come in and go to the slide master and come to the slide master and I can go change the logo. The logo is not in the Power BI report as an object, it's in the background and it's on every page. And that way it is in every page in the exact same spot. And as you navigate between pages, it doesn't wiggle around, it doesn't move, it's there. While I was there, I went in and put these navigations that I put on all my reports. One is a clear all filters and one is to go back to the page I was just on. I have found these enormously useful for users who get lost. Where am I in the report? What what did I do? What filters did I hit? I, I just want to go back. Uh, and I oftentimes make the logo take me back home to the landing page. So I can hit home, reset, and I'm where I started. Um, similarly, I, I have gone in and created some colors. Um, these are the colors I like. I recommend colors. I'm 
nearly certain Megan will get into some color theory in her session, as I've attended her sessions in the past, and she's got some great ideas there. Not my thing. I'm not going to go there. Um, this colors were from uh, a partner I work with regularly, and this is the theme from their logo. Uh, there's a lot of connotation that goes with some of these colors and so on. But if you want to create a new one, it's really easy to create a new. You just copy this slide and change the color. And then when you get to the slides, if you decide you want, you can select all the slides. You can go change your layout and I can switch them all to this lighter color. Or I can go switch them all to this color. And now all of the slides are this color. And if I don't have one, so I currently have what, 30, 28 in this collection. If I realize that I don't have one that I want, I can go copy this slide, duplicate. I can come to the duplicate and I can go, OK, I want it to look like this. I am not going to take the time I normally take to get these all perfectly lined up because um, you get the idea, right? So now I can have this in my slide in my template. And then I will show you the magic on how you get it out. So if you've done this, you got the colors you want, you got the layouts you want, you simply come to File, Export, Change File Type. It defaults to a PDF, and I want to make it a PNG. So I'm going to make it a PNG, and I'm going to save it as. And it's going to come up and want to know where to save it. Save it to your local machine. Heads up, pro tip, tip from the trenches. It does not like saving it to OneDrive. I live and breathe on OneDrive. Everything I do lives on OneDrive. It doesn't like, it, it for some reason can't create the folder to put the files in on OneDrive if I just pick this OneDrive. I happen to have a dedicated hard drive that is my cache copy of all my OneDrive. So if I come in this way and I drill in, I found a way around that weird bug. But if you get a bug that comes up and says it couldn't save, don't save it to a network share. You're going to have to save it locally um, to get it to work. So if I come to my Power BI and I create a summit folder, um, it's going to ask me, do you want to put all the slides or just this one? And I hit all, and it'll take a minute It'll go out and it'll generate an individual PNG file for each of the 29 files I have in this folder. So while it's doing that, um, all right, it did it. It put them there. And if I were to go to that folder, let's see, here it is, Summit 2020. We can see all of the files are here. View, extra big. Here they are, including this one that I didn't quite lay out exactly because it was a demo. Oh, that's not even the one I demoed for you. Um, where is the one I, I just created? Uh, hmm. I'm not seeing it, but you get the idea. So now here they are, and now I can use them in my report. Um, so if I go from PowerPoint to Power BI Desktop, Oops. Here is um, my report. And if I were to create a new page by duplicating this page, I can very easily say, you know what? I don't want this visual like this anymore. I think I want this to be taller. Come on, taller. And I want this one to be taller. And rather than spend a crazy amount of time trying to line these up and putting a border on them all, I can simply leverage the ability of this background to, uh, sorry, I need to be on the page, paint roller, page background. I'm going to not use that slide, and I'm going to go navigate to my new folder I just created, and we're going to use a different layout. I picked the wrong one, but you get the idea, right? So now it's really easy to have all of your 
reports looking and feeling the same. All of the pages within a report looking and feeling the same. So I'm going to jump back to the presentation. A few too many slides and see what we have next. OK, so um, I'm going to pause a little bit here, uh, roughly our midpoint. Um, talk about we, we talked a little bit about legacy reporting to put it in perspective what you're going to do with Power BI, some layout considerations um, with the back. And then we'll get into some visuals and I, I want to back up a little bit and go into this layout and, and talk about um, this, this layout that I've put together a little bit before we jump into visuals. So let's flip back. And we're going to go to the service where I have uh, my report um, that you saw in the Power BI desktop. And here I have adopted uh, a, a concept I use on just about every report I do. There's practically never a report that doesn't have time as a factor, a slicer. So I have across the top, I have time. So this is the year. Um, this is the period. This happens to be a 13 fiscal period concept. Very common in retail to have 13 28 day periods instead of 12 months of varying lengths. And then this is the weeks. So every period has four weeks. Uh, exactly four weeks. Um, there, there's no others here because there's data missing. This is fictitious data I lumped together to create this. So on all of my reports, I have time. And I put it in this position and it's here. On every single page, so if we were to go look at the other pages, every single page has it in the same position, a unified. Comfortable uh, spot for users to know they can always come here and get this just like they can always come do these reset buttons here. For this example on the left, I have an example of a hierarchy. I often get people who tell me, well, I need a report and I need I need five reports. I need one for each region of the country, and then I need one for all of the regions lumped together. And I put this together to explain that we don't have to do that anymore in Power BI, because if you want to see just this region, you just click on it. You want to see just this region, you click on it. You want to see them all, then you have them all. You can either turn off the individual select or I can just highlight them all, whatever the user is more comfortable with, and you get to see them all. And I further put this together to show how we can have slicers that um, these are the chiclet slicer that shows the different ways that it filters. And on nearly all my reporting, the company has an, an org chart, an organization, a hierarchy of some kind, and I usually use that here. Sometimes I won't use the org chart when it does not apply and I'll use other slicers in this dedicated navigation pane to page specific context filtering for what's on this report. So maybe we have all these pages where we do slice it by the various locations, right? These could be stores. These could be outlets, um, whatever the company hierarchy is. But maybe you just wanted to do analytics on the various items sold, regardless of where they were sold. Uh, this would get replaced with some slicers specific to the context here. And I have an example I'll show of that a little later. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about, we talked about the legacy data and where you've come from and how things look different and all over and how you can embrace moving forward and advancing into Power BI with some consistency and a consistent look and feel uh, for your reporting. Whether you wrote it or somebody else wrote it, uh, the organization will see it as one uh, unified professional um, company solution, a true enterprise grade reporting solution. All right, I'm going to have to pick up the pace. Uh, let's go back to the slide deck and um, talk a little bit about visuals and, and we're going to be OK. Uh, I'm going to reserve some time at the end for some question and answer. So yes, this is the recorded portion, but I will be here in person uh, watching this with you. 
uh, painful. It's it's painful to watch yourself and hear yourself, but um, I will. And then at the end, we'll do some Q&A. That's why this is so hard. I like Q&A along the way and I can elaborate. Uh, it has timing challenges, but here's again some examples of some visuals. And you saw this when we were in the report. Here's two line charts representing year over year, right? Um, net sales, net sales previous year. This shows the difference in sales. So you can see sales were really close here and it, the variance between years was nearly zero. And then we had a variance. And then here in the end, we had a really big variance. And this visual shows this differently. And different users had different takes. Here's some ideas on visuals. This is a very common one, right? I want to see this year versus last year. But now you're required to do mental math and you're like, OK, this month we were off by 0.11 million whereas you could represent it this way and i if i was back in power bi let's just do that oh no in the service uh oh did i close the window Here it is. So if you hover over it, I could get the actual amount right there. Um, so the percent change, right? All right, this is one thing, but we see that difference visually. Here we represent it as a percent change and it puts it in perspective. All different ways to show this. And that was the intent of this page was to show that. And then this is sales and this is the breakout of sales because in the restaurant industry, we're always interested in food versus beverage versus alcohol sales and how that changes and what those trends are. So different visuals are different ways to do that. Um, and then here in this example report, I kept some consistency. I didn't start mixing up all kinds of different visuals so that users had a comfort level in their experience with the data storytelling. And to the storytelling aspect, um, I'm going to actually stay here. Here on the landing page, we have really too many visuals, but it was important to show these 12 primary KPIs that drive the business. So we kind of deviated from our rule of six or eight, five, six, eight, maybe at the most, and went with 12. Uh, and here, the visual in the background, this is the trend by month. So if I pick a month, the trend disappears and the number is that month's number. Uh, when I don't pick the month, this number is the most current month's number, and this is the trend of what's going on. And if you want to know more about what happened with net sales, you can click here and you can get the rest of the story. So that's just the introduction to the story, and here's the details of the story. Year over year comparison, I, I don't have a year picked, so it wasn't showing. And then here's the breakout in food and sales. And this is the variance. This is the year over year variance. And this is the variance for the budgeted sales. Similarly, if I want to know more about food sales, I can click here. Uh, that link's broken. And take you to food sales. And I get more of the story of the food sales. So I can walk through my storytelling experience and find more. So we saw sales, we saw food sales. Now here we get to see food sales that we budgeted 49 million, but actually only did 46 million. And it looks like most of it we lost in burger sales or down 2 million. But thankfully catering covered a lot of that burger loss, right? 2 million and 2 million. So that was kind of a wash. Uh, and then these other categories, and we can see that um, now. And then part of the food story for this industry is, okay, this is sales. What was what happened with costs? So we budgeted costs. And then here's a use of a waterfall chart to see where we got to with actual food costs. And then nice big charts to show it as a percentage. Because some users, to my point earlier on having a report that fits a variety of users, High level, C level executives generally aren't interested in this piece until it's a problem, uh, particularly if this is okay. So, if food costs uh, were 18% better than goal, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm going to go over here and look at labor and what happened with labor. Okay. 
slide deck. There we go. All right. So we talked about it visuals, and I, I did a lot of it in the demo rather than do it um, um, here in the slide deck. But here's some more. So you saw those. So um, our friends at SQL BI, um, amazing guys, um, have this visual reference. And this is from September 2017, if you look here in the top. And uh, great chart. Uh, for many years, this was printed on a tabloid sheet, 11 by 17, and on the wall of my cubicle. Just a year later, in 2018, this is the chart. Look at that change in one year. So this shaded area, the legend tells us, not recommended, there are better alternatives, or it's just a clone. Um, the preferred ones are shaded this color. These are some others that you could use, and then these are not recommended. Check out 2018. We still have our preferred. We have our white. We have our not recommended, and then we have our don't use in this category. Uh, love this. Uh, I had this on my wall as a reference, and look how much it's grown. I went to see if they had updated this since, and I could not find it. And I'm not surprised because it, it wouldn't even fit on a tabloid today because there are so many visuals available to us in Power BI. So explore them, but be careful with them. This, this slide here is uh, to point out exactly that. Just because it's this great killer visual and you just love a whisker chart, um, remember your customer, remember your end user. We're looking to do effective storytelling and you want to stick with the ones that work. Um, and particularly if you're just getting started uh, and your users are just getting started with a visual representation of data, small steps work well. All right, uh, here's them side by side, right? 17, 18, this is now two years old. Um, it'd be crazy to see what it could be like today. And uh, to that point, I'm only going to take a second because I'm uh, crushing up on time. Uh, if you, if if I go back to the desktop, RBI desktop, if you uh, your visuals are here, I can expand this out. We can see a little better. Uh, the three ellipses, the ones before are the ones that come with the, any Power BI that you open. After the ellipses are ones that you have added from the custom visual. Uh, it used to be called the marketplace. Uh, I'm going to click on it and you get more visuals. If you have saved some to a folder, you can import the visuals from a file. Um, that's not uncommon if you bought a visual, a custom visual, and you have the file somewhere. Uh, however, they are updated pretty regularly. Um, so unless you need to get it from a file, you can get more visuals by clicking here on more visuals. And it will go to the marketplace. Yeah, it's thinking. Um, it's not called the marketplace anymore. It's called the app source. Uh, Microsoft loves to change what they call things. And um, I kind of liked the marketplace. It made sense. Uh, app source, I don't care for, just like we now call, uh, I, I showed you earlier, we have the report workspaces and then we have apps. Uh, I disagree, I think that's a little bit of a lame name because an app is usually something on your phone um, or an application on your desktop, not necessarily this little functionality in the browser. Uh, so I don't know why it's thinking and taking so long. Uh, normally, I don't have any tunnels up. Oh, all right, there it popped up, strange. So there are all kinds. So it defaults to the editor's pick. You can go to all and you can see this scroll list is quite lengthy. You can filter and you can go down to filters. So these are just the filter visuals. Uh, this is a neat new one I'm looking forward to using on a project where we have kind of a toggle switch to hide multiple data fields with an on off switch. I've seen ways to do this with bookmarks. Um, it's neat to see I haven't used this. Uh, the, oh, I uh, mentioned earlier the Actaris visuals that I've worked with where we allow right back to the database. Some custom visuals may have a, a cost. Um, some do not. Even when they say may require, it's usually a may. If you're only using it for little things, it's usually still free. Anyways, you get the idea. There are many, 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 and you can write your own. 
and I have seen people uh, and you write some great ones uh, on their own. So here they are. If you want one, you simply pick it and click add and it will go and add it. And it happened really fast. I don't know if you saw it, but it popped up here. Now I have the bullet chart and I can easily come to a new page and add that visual and then configure it. It looks like there's lots of capability of this one I happen to grab. So you get the idea. Be careful with your visuals. I'm gonna go back here and give you a reminder. Be careful with your visuals. Uh, look at these charts, uh, think about it, and remember your, your user, your end customer. Okay, um, report templates. I am gonna cover this really fast and I would encourage you to create some templates. I showed you how to do the background templates, but here I'm talking about report templates where you, uh, we're gonna go here to Power BI. I have a couple templates that I've created. So we can see here, I have two coast tech template slicer left nav and organization left nav. So if I open this one, it is uh, a Power BI file. Uh, I call it a template. It's not a special file type or anything like an Excel template. Um, it's just the template that I start with that already has uh, a background layout for me. It already has my navigation because all of my reports in my organization are gonna have time slicers. So my time slicers are already in place across the top. The connector to the data source for those is already in place. And I don't have to do the common practice that most of you all are probably doing, where you go open an existing report and then start chopping stuff out of it. Well, go chop stuff out of it and immediately do a save as. So, and then here's the key. As soon as you open your template, do a save as and save it as the name of the new project. And while you're at it, check it into source control. So here we have my template that has my uh, my left nav. And I mentioned earlier that I also sometimes use that lab left nav bar as a context sensitive navigation filter pane, meaning the data that's on the page, uh, I use slicers and filters for that data that's on the page there. So this template allows me to quickly, effectively create consistent looking reports uh, for my team, for the, for, for the company by my team. And here I simply created a template that had a bunch of the different common slicers that I use. And I gave them a little name. So this is a pick list slicer. Here's a, a summary pick list. And I just threw in some dates as placeholders. Um, Here's one that uses the chiclet slicer. Um, this one's a drop down, uh, just as placeholders. And you'll notice there's not a whole bunch of pages in this because it's so easy to just duplicate the page, come here, go to the background, change the background. I'm not gonna use that slide from my image gallery. I'm gonna go use this one. And there you go. And now we have a template for building consistent um, reports across the enterprise to allow for a better user experience in their data storytelling journey that you're gonna take them on. Uh, okay, templates. I have just a few minutes left and I wanna talk a little bit about project scoping. Uh, for you to be an effective data storyteller, you need to know what the user needs. So you need to do some requirements gathering. You need to go get the data from them. They may bring you uh, an existing report and say, recreate this for me. Uh, or they may say, you know, we kind of want a report that's like this, but it needs to have these numbers in it instead of these. And that's great. You have a, an example. So you have a large idea on the layout, even though the layout may be lame, um, you have a starting spot. But importantly, you have a reference that you can use to check that your data on your report matches because the data sources are possibly different and or they've manipulated the data, they've massaged it outside of the source system, which you're not gonna be doing 
other than some DAX. So to get your requirements gathering, scope out the work, document it, do some mock-ups, but don't go crazy. I talked to someone who would sit down at a workstation with Power BI desktop, and then they would throw a bunch of visuals on the page with the user and go, oh, so do you want it to look like this? Do you want it to look like that? that neat idea. I would question some of the aspects of that in that I know the visuals to use, and I'll probably just do that without the user's input because the in user might select some visuals that aren't optimum. And then they also start to get all wrapped up in colors. And you really don't want to do colors initially. In fact, I oftentimes, when I do the next point of rapid prototyping, I will oftentimes just throw it out there with the stock colors that come with the visual and not go customizing it at all until it gets settled because users will get go, well, I really, I really want that blue. Um, and, oh, and those are red. Those have to be red. And try and avoid some of that and, and get to that later once the general framework is in because color matters. And um, we as data professionals and visualization professionals have a better understanding of the right colors to use and the colors not to use and et cetera. Uh, and, and try and just stay away from that. I like to do quick changes, sometimes changes, multiple changes within a day uh, or within a week for sure, and no more than two weeks between, between changes and user acceptance testing. I like to make some changes, get some UAT, make some changes, get some UAT, really quick turnaround so that you don't go down a path and spend a bunch of time on something to have user come back and go, oh no, that's not what I was talking about. Uh, and, and you've lost a bunch of time. Back to the requirements gathering, uh, a practice I use regularly is ask your users why they want the report, not just what they want on the report, but why do they want it? What, what business problem, what pain are they feeling that they're trying to solve and answer so that you can create a better report than what they brought you? understand the business and the why, you can also likely create a report that will fit more users. Because if that user is having that question about the business, then this other user in marketing might be having a similar question about the business. And if you wrote the report just for that operations person, it might not be very useful to the marketing person, but you could, if you knew the whole picture, make some changes that would be good for both of them. All right, uh, and then get sign off. Get sign off. Um, it's a whole it's a whole different world uh, for us uh, in consulting, um, but it's a good practice for you inside your organization to get your UAT, get your sign off, um, so you can move on. All right, conclusion. We talked a bit about legacy reporting, so that you understand where you're at. It helps you know where to go, uh, and some of what your users are accustomed to because uh, you will see some uh, resistance to change uh, and or just adoption challenges with anything new, uh, particularly something like uh, moving to Power BI. Uh, layout considerations, I think I hammered pretty good. I showed you how to use uh, background images with my little background creator in PowerPoint. Uh, some considerations about visuals. Uh, accounts, how many is appropriate on a page, how to lay them out on a page, uh, using report templates and some project scoping and uh, end users, et cetera. And then I close all of my sessions with these slides and I have for as long as I've been speaking and I've had dozens of speaking engagements and uh, the, the one on the right, you get to see clearly because it's not on a projector and you're 40 feet away. Um, but you can see how faded that is. It's been on my cubicle wall when I was in a cubicle for over a decade. Uh, I still have it somewhere, uh, even though I took a picture of it. it. You got it almost right, it's still wrong. Uh, and, I, and I try and live and, and, and believe in that. And then I've been in too many shops where there's technical debt, and I had this on the wall, on, on my cubicle wall, right behind my head, so that when I turned around and the boss said, um, do this and I suggested that we maybe do some of this because it would make more sense in the long run. And when they told me, uh, just get it done, um, 
they'd have to say that to me looking at that right over my head. Uh, no thanks, we are too busy. Um, there's too much technical debt in, in our world um, that we do as professionals. Um, don't perpetuate it. Um, avoid it and try and fix it when you encounter it. And now my new slide, um, consider the person behind you. Uh, I have been in some code, particularly T-SQL store procedures, and I've been reading it, and I've looked through it, and I've gone, oh my goodness. What, who, what, why? You gotta be kidding me. And I'll scroll up to the top to the uh, change log history, and I'll go, oh my. I've learned a lot in five years. Um, I have another session I do on just commenting your code. Uh, it's important to comment your code. You can comment your T-SQL very, very easily. Green is good. Uh, and same thing in your DAX. Um, write good, clear, coherent DAX, comment it, um, and format your DAX. If it's not formatted, it's not DAX. And um, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's particularly important for business logic. It's one thing to comment some code so that you can remember what it was doing when you come back to it in five years. Uh, it's really important when it's business logic, where you have a filter out this, where, this, because, and if you have a comment in there because of some weirdness in the data source or some weird business rule, think of the person behind you. Think of the next newbie on the job and leave a good legacy. So um, that's it. That's my uh, soapbox, uh, my session. Um, that's me. Reach out to me um, on uh, email or, or LinkedIn and take care. Be safe. Catch the other sessions in the series. Uh, if that's of interest to you, I assure you they will be excellent. I will be there myself. I assure you, guarantee you. And uh, thank you. Uh, enjoy your past virtual summit this year. Look forward to meeting you all face to face when we do meet again uh, in 2021. And I will be sticking around for the live Q&A right now.